My name is Reagan Higgins, and I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. I consider myself to be a theoretical mathematician who's dabbling in her applied side. Research is definitely person-driven, so when I advise students, it's definitely student-driven. I'm going to provide you some boundaries, and then you have the freedom to work inside those boundaries. So as long as you're doing your lit reviews, you're putting the time in, once you go down one path, you learn something, you're like, okay, well, this is going to make me think of something else. The main benefit us is that you learn to be an independent thinker and you get to do what you like, not necessarily what someone says you must do. So I was trained to answer the question, why? My research students are pushing me toward how, how, how. And it's led to this research question. Can time scales be used to model prostate cancer treatment? So behind skin cancer, prostate cancer is most common in men. It's treated in various ways. My research focuses on hormone therapy, which is one type of treatment for prostate cancer. So with this hormone therapy, I study intermittent androgen deprivation therapy, or IAD. Now why IAD? From a life perspective or a practical perspective, it's much better for the patient because there are breaks in treatment. So the quality of life is better, it reduces the amount of side effects for the treatment. Mathematically, I like IAD because it falls in line with my area of time scales. So time scales combines, let's say, continuous time and discrete time. So continuous time is when everything is smooth, and discrete time is when everything is choppy. So time scales puts those things together and it allows us to model. Why is this good for IAD? Well, intermittent. So you're on treatment, you're off treatment, you're on treatment, off treatment. So time scales and IAD match very perfectly. So what is a time scale? A time scale is a non-empty, arbitrary, closed subset of the real numbers. What does that mean? Think of everything you basically know. So there are some examples. So the real numbers is an example, the integers is an example, and the last example when you have um, this set 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, etc., union 0, this is considered a time scale too because, of course, it's a subset of real numbers. These are all real numbers, but it's closed because it has its limit points. So as you think about it, these numbers are getting progressively small, and what are they doing? They are approaching zero, and zero is a part of this time scale. So this is an example of a time scale. Obviously, zero, one is not a time scale because it's not closed, right? We have open intervals here. So because this is open on both sides, then we would say this is not a time scale. So you have these examples of time scales and not time scales. So for my research, our time scale of choice is this union of closed disjoint intervals. So pictorially, it looks like this. And then you have a pink point, and then you have this closed blue point, and then you have a closed pink point, and then another and a pink point. So these are all off treatment. So when the patient is not receiving any treatment, so we're modeling off treatment intervals. So this is zero. We say this is A long, and the space between consecutive all treatment intervals is B. So this is A plus B. Since this is A long, this is 2A plus B. But then if we jump another B, then, keep my color stick same, mm-hmm, you get it. This is 2A plus what, 2B, and then because this is A long, this would be 3A plus 2B. And then you just continue, and continue in this, um, fashion, and that's why we have it as a union, and we write boldface P, A, comma, B. So this is modeling off treatment intervals. So we make some assumptions. So you have a domain. This is my domain. This is what I want to think about. This is my operating space. Now, how do I define the equation or what I'm talking about for this domain? So we have, we make three assumptions. So our first assumption is N of T is the PSA level. So what is PSA? PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. So that's a protein that um, is generated by healthy and cancerous prostate, prostate cells. So 
N of T is just your PSA. How much PSA is in the prostate? So, and this is measured in nanograms per milliliter. So anything above four nanograms per milliliter lets us know that the patient potentially has prostate cancer. Then we say it grows exponentially. So what we're gonna assume is N of T looks like gamma to the T, because this is a form of an exponential, and we're gonna assume that gamma is not E. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the generalized exponential, it could be any exponential. And our points T belong, oops, T, this says N, my bad. But T is in your time scale. Then our third assumption says that the PSA levels depreciate at a constant rate of B. So why does that make sense? Well, if you're on treatment, you would hope that your PSA levels go down, right? The treatment is working, we wanna have less cancer in our, in our prostate or in his prostate. So this is modeled by N of the quantity K plus one times A plus B is equal to beta, so that's our depreciation, times n of the quantity k, uh, da, 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 da. sorry, k times a plus b plus a. So these are three basic assumptions we make. N of t is the PSA level, so how much PSA is in your blood is going to grow exponentially because it will grow, right? the levels are gonna rise, but we want it to decrease when you are not on treatment. So when you're off treatment, think about this as being off, when you're off, you have some kind of exponential growth. And then when you're off treatment, you want it to go down. And it's gonna go down because beta is between zero and one. So you multiply them by a fraction less than one, and of course we know it's gonna make it shrink. So now once we have these three assumptions, we gotta put it all together. So remember calculus and differential equations, you always talked about a derivative, right? Especially in calculus. Can you find the derivative that was the core? Well, that's, I shouldn't say that. That was one of the three main topics of calculus one. You had your limits, your derivative, and then your integral. So on time scales, we have a derivative, but we call it the delta derivative. So look at that definition that says delta derivative, the second one. So this is delta. Greek for delta, and that's the way we define the derivative. So the top definition is defined, let me write a little neater, it's defined in two parts. So the top part says when sigma of t is bigger than t, and the bottom part says when sigma of t is equal to t. So you're saying what is sigma? Well sigma is just the next point to the right. I'm just going to write to right. So think about in our case, we had, I think I did it this way, and a little pink point, and then we had some space, mm -hmm, and another pink point, right? So this was zero, this is a, this is a plus b, and this is 2a plus b, right? So when your neighbor is bigger than you, right, so A plus B is bigger than A, then you get a different thing when your derivative happens because in this case, sigma of A, the person to the right of it is A plus B. But if I met sigma, let's say, of A plus B, who's really next to me? Well, there are so many points in here, right? Like lots and lots and lots of decimals. So I really can't tell the difference between 1.9 and 1.99 and then 1.99 and 1.9999 and basically they all round up to be two. So in that case, we'll say I am my own neighbor. So it depends on if you have space or not space or the gap between the points. That determines who your neighbor is. So that neighbor then affects who your derivative is. So the top definition, think about this from calculus as the slope of the secant line. And then the bottom one is the slope of the tangent line. And you spend a lot of time in Cal 1 doing that. So 
those what those definitions mean without having to go through all the symbols. But as a mathematician, I have to be complete. I got to write all of it down. But what does it mean? The top one is the slope of the secant line. The bottom one is the slope of the tangent line. And that mu that's there, this is pronounced mu, and it's just sigma of t minus t. So it's the space between the points. Okay? So now that we know how to define the derivative, what are we going to do with it? We are going to look at a test case. So anytime that you want to generalize anything, you got to look at a couple of examples, a couple of test cases. That's what mathematicians do. We say, hey, it happened this way. Now, does it happen again this way or not? So let's look at a test case. So if our test case is this time scale P35. So what does that mean? Remember, we wrote it this way. So in this case, we're saying A is equal to 3 and B is equal to 5. So that's, I have this picture, 0, 3, then you take a space of 5, 8, 11, space of 5, 16, 19, so forth and, th so, forth and so on. So easily you would see that sigma of 3 is going to be 8, right? But sigma of 8 is just 8 itself. So keep that time scale in your mind as we do these test cases. So what really happened? Oops. What's going to happen here? So we have to think about our three assumptions. We made the assumption that it's going to grow exponentially. So if we grow exponentially, think about on um, 0 to 3, for example. Then from calculus, we know n prime of t, how do we describe that, is um, the natural log of gamma times n of t. That's what we know is going to happen on the space where this is open because all of these are dense points. So these are real points so I can describe my exponential growth that way. Now what happens when I'm dealing with another space, let's say now that I am <laughs> closed at 3 and but now open at 8. So this is 3, but I'm close at 8. So this is what's happening when you are off treatment, and now this is what's happening when you're on treatment. So what did we assume? We said when you're on treatment, you're going to expect the PSA levels to go down. So think about how that translates in this specific case. So that means n of 8k plus 8 in general, or you can think about this as just being 8, if you make k equal 0, is beta, the value that's going to make it go down, times n of 8k plus 3, because that's where I started. So think about it. If k was 0, this would be 3, and this would be 8. So I want my levels to go down. I want these levels to go down. So this is assumption 2. This is assumption 3. Now how does this help me in building? Well, this says n of 8k plus 8 minus n of 8k plus 3. Remember what you do to one side, you have to do to the other side. So you take it away or subtract it from both sides. When you do that subtraction, and I'm going to divide by 5, 2, what do we notice? Well, we just talked about that sigma of 3, sorry, not sigma of 3 is 8, right? So assuming that this was a 0, if k was 0, these points relate to each other. So this just says n of sigma of t minus n of t over mu. Why mu? Because the space between these points is what? 5. 8 minus 5 is Sorry, 8 minus 3 is 5, so mu has to be 5. So what have I really done? I've built the derivative. This is what we showed earlier in the first case when you think about the slope of the secant line. So this says n delta of t has this very nice form of beta minus 1 over 5 times n of t, where I'm calling t 8k plus 3. So when I'm on treatment, I know what I look like. When I'm off treatment, 
I can simply say n delta of t is the natural log of gamma times n of t because I replaced this prime with my combined derivative, which is the delta derivative. So what I would do is continue to do more and more test cases to draw some conclusions. So in summary, this is what I know. I know when I'm on an interval that looks like this, I have this derivative. And when I'm on an interval that looks like this, I have this other derivative. So depending on where you are, your derivative is going to be different. And that's the beauty of time scales because I can say I'm here, my derivative looks like this, or I'm in this case, my derivative looks like this. Whereas when we were doing calculus, there was only one type of derivative. So time scale says I can have at least two types of derivative, and depending on where I am on my time scale, my derivative will switch as necessary. Why is that important here? There will be a switch when the patient goes from on treatment to off treatment. So he's on treatment, we know what his level should look like, we know how to model that. Oh, that's the goal, to figure out how to model that. When he's off treatment, then we also know how to model that. And we don't have to have two separate models, we can put all of that together. That's what time scales allows us to do. So what do we do next? So we would try to move forward. We would do more time scales. Let's say choose A and B to be different values, or fix A and then vary B, or fix B and vary A. And we will use the definition of the integral. We will also use the definition of the generalized exponential. So there's a more general exponential than the one that you know. And we would use that information to eventually get a solution to what we call this dynamic equation. And then we would take that solution that we have, test it against some data, so patient data, about their PSA levels and see how well our model fits. So if you're interested in doing more in this area, feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Dr. Reagan Higgins, and I am an associate professor here in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Thank you. Thank you.